Okay, we're clear. All right, the title of this is False Condemnation. And um, I think that's a good title for it. It's something Brian mentioned earlier that I believe every one of us will face at some point. Um, it's part of the Christian walk. It's one of the things that you have to walk through on the way um, to the finish line. So let's go ahead and first define what condemnation is. And I like to use Webster's 1828. I think it's, um, uh, it's pretty accurate. It's got a biblical worldview to it. It always helps me understand uh, words in Scripture a little bit better, along with the Strong's Concordance, too. Um, condemnation defined. It is the act of condemning, judicially, declaring one guilty, and dooming him to punishment. Definition two, the state of being condemned. Three, the cause or reason of a sentence of condemnation. Okay, and now what is true condemnation? True condemnation is when you are in sin. You are condemned by the word of God because you are in disobedience to it. Okay, that's true condemnation. And that, that there, if you are in sin, you should be condemned. You'll know that you're condemned. You'll know exactly what you're condemned for, a sinful life, or even one sin. You'll know what that sin is. Uh, your conscience will let you know. It'll be decent and in order. There'll be no confusion with it. What is false? Let's go ahead to a, a scripture that explains what the condemnation is. Let's go to John chapter 3, verse 19. And John chapter 3, verse 19 through 21. And this is the condemnation, that light is come into the world, Jesus Christ, the truth, the word of God. And men loved darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For every one that doeth evil hates the light, neither comes to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that does truth comes to the light, that his deeds may be manifest, that they are wrought in God. But the condemnation of the whole world is that they rejected the word of God. They rejected the truth. They rejected Jesus Christ. This is the condemnation. And that is the only condemnation that you will ever receive. It's condemnation for sin. Sin is the only thing that will separate you from God. Sin. That's it. So let's move on. What is false condemnation then? False condemnation, under point two is condemnation not based on the truth of God. Okay? So you're being condemned for something that the Word of God doesn't even say you should be condemned for. If you're being condemned for truth's sake, it's because you're in some type of sin. You're in one or more sins that separate you from God. That's true condemnation. False condemnation is simply condemnation that is not true. It's false. So... How does false condemnation start? Well, two common ways that I was bouncing off different uh, brothers and sisters in Christ through their experiences, my own experiences, how this starts. Here's the two most common ways, and the only two I'm familiar with so far. Not that there aren't more, but these are the two that I've found so far. And then let's go to uh, Roman numeral 2, uh, point A there. We compare ourselves against each other. We measure ourselves against other brothers and sisters in Christ. Okay, this is how you could start to condemn yourself. My personal uh, testimony was I started seeing other brothers and sisters that were strong in the Lord. And I was still relatively new to the truth getting into the Bible school. And I started looking at what they were, were doing and what I wasn't doing. Okay? Now some of these have walked with the Lord many more years than I have walked with the Lord. And they've been built, refined, improved, taught. And they're doing things for the Lord more actively than I was at that time. But at the same time, I'm in preparation, just like they were at one point. But I started thinking to myself, well, if they're doing this, then, you know, I'm not, I'm not doing this. I'm not, I'm not you know, uh, as uh, holy or as uh, zealous or as knowledgeable and I started measuring myself not against what we're to measure ourselves from, which is the cornerstone, the Word of God, but I started measuring myself against other people. All right, I'm just going to draw the 
first two pillars because these are going to come in handy, it seems like an appropriate time, so we'll do them now. So we have our foundation, 1 Corinthians 3.11, for other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. We've got our cornerstone, the Word of God. We've got our mind, our heart, or the will, free will. Of course, when we come into relationship, we're born again, baptized with the Holy Spirit, it's the first commandment. Before we go out into any type of ministry or witnessing, we are commanded to be filled with His Holy Spirit, continue on in spirit and in truth. All right, so our measuring stone, our cornerstone, just to, to wrap it up real quick, is um, the cornerstone is put in position specifically so you can make sure everything is lined up correctly. So if you see something that looks out of whack, you don't look at the stone that is out of whack and go, well, we should make everything else line up with this one. No, you've already set a stone that's plumb, square, and level that you know is perfect. You've, you've examined it, you've scrutinized it, you find no fault in that stone. Okay? And you measure everything else off of that stone. That's what tells you the other ones are messed up. So instead of measuring myself according to the Word of God, I was measuring myself against other people. Okay, that's a no-no. One quick distraction, and now I start getting into false condemnation, self-condemnation. I'm not doing enough. Um, you know, there was uh, there were some that were, uh, and you know, Lord bless everybody that's participating in the ministry. I'm just coming from the perspective that I wasn't called to that ministry yet, but I was seeing that ministry. And I wanted to partake of it, whether it be out, go out witnessing, whether it be preach, whether it be, you know, um, teach or anything like that. But I, I started getting wrapped up in what everybody else was doing. And I tried to do it all because, you know, I had to look at how holy these people were. And I started getting myself into bondage to works, more and more works, as opposed to faith in Christ, faith in God, according to the word of God. So let's see what the Word says on comparing ourselves against each other. Let's go to 2 Corinthians 10.12. 2 Corinthians 10.12. Every answer for any problem that we have in this life can be found in God's Word, His Scripture, the Bible. says in verse 12 of 2 Corinthians chapter 10, For we dare not make ourselves of the number, or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves. But they measuring themselves by themselves, and comparing themselves among themselves, are not wise. Okay? It's not wise to do that. Now here you've got some people that say that there's something, and surround themselves with other people that say they're something, and they continue to pat themselves on the back, you know, and that's how they think they're okay. We see that constantly, uh, whether it be in politics, the religious system, or, uh, you know, even professional football. You name it, there's people patting other people on the back, comparing themselves amongst themselves. Uh, whether you be rich, and whether, you know, if you're Warren Buffett, you might compare yourself to Bill Gates, you know, constantly that's how they're approving themselves. But in the body, this can happen, too, if you allow it. You can start. It's no, there's, there's nothing wrong with emulating and learning from the brethren. But when you start measuring yourself by other people instead of the word of God, that's where you get into problems. That's where you get distracted from the truth, from faith. Let's also go to Second Corinthians, or excuse me, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Verses 12 through 31. And this is where I encourage people to head it off. Because if you don't head off that distraction, we'll get into it a little bit later, but if you don't stop it at its point of origin, it's just like anything else. Once it gets into your heart, it's, it's that much harder to remove it from here, you know, than to cast it down here in your mind. So I encourage you to recognize these things and stand fast in your liberty. 
you know, not to compare yourself against other people, but to measure yourself against the Word of God. 1 Corinthians 12, 12 through 3. For as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one Spirit. For the body is not one member, but many members. If the foot shall say, Because I am not the hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear shall say, Because I am not the eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where were the smelling? But now hath God set the members, every one of them, in the body, as it has pleased him. And if they were all one member, where were the body? But now are they members, yet but one body. And the eye cannot say unto the hand, I have no need of thee, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. Nay, much more those members of the body, which seem to be more feeble, are necessary. And those members of the body, which we think to be less honorable, upon these we bestow more abundant honor, and our uncomely parts have more abundant comeliness. For our comely parts have no need, but God hath tempered the body together, having given more abundant honor to that part which lacked, that there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for another. And whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. Or one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now you are the body of Christ, and members in particular. And God hath set some in the church, first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers, and after that miracles, then gifts and healings, helps, governments, diversities of tongues. And then he questions here. He says, are all apostles... Are they? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Are all workers of miracles? Have all the gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? This, of course, is speaking of the gifts. But covet earnestly the best gifts, and yet I yet show I unto you a more excellent way. So here Paul addresses, you know, there's many different functions within the body of Christ. And he points out how ridiculous it would be if we were all an eyeball, if we were all a mouth, but that we all serve in different functions. And godliness with contentment is great gain. We're to be um, content in whatever state we find ourselves, whether it be preparation, whether it be ministry. I love teaching overseas. I love teaching anybody, anywhere. But I am not always teaching. Um, A lot of my time spent for the Lord directly is in preparation. And then as you continue to prepare yourself, then he can use you. You don't jump out ahead of him. Um, You have to have the goods before you can give them away. But anyway, getting back to it, you don't want to compare yourselves against other parts of the body. Okay, Learn from them. The whole body is to build the weakest part up and get everybody stronger continually to build, to edify, to encourage, to strengthen that which remains. That's the whole purpose. But this is how you could get into self-condemnation. If you're comparing yourselves and you find that you being a thumb aren't as big as a bicep, then you go, oh, man, I'm not a bicep. And then you start getting discouraged, disappointed. Okay? Stay focused on the Word. Build yourselves up. And, you know, who knows? It's up to the Lord how He uses you, but He wants strong brothers and sisters in Christ no matter where He puts you. Uh, there's nothing wrong with, even if you're a help, you know, it may not be uh, uh, overtly glorious by the world standard, but if you're a help, he wants you to be the strongest help you possibly can be, okay? Even when Moses was uh, running the show in, uh, at Mount, Mount Sinai, okay, and leading the people of Israel, uh, Joshua was ministering to Moses, trying to help him, encourage him, build him up. And then later we see Joshua took over, you know, for Moses. But strength, he wants strength in all different areas, but we aren't to compare ourselves amongst one another. That is unwise according to Scripture. All right, the other way that you could possibly get into uh, 
false condemnation. Uh, and this is one I've, I've been through both of these. If and, and whenever the enemy sometimes comes at you, he'll question, just like he questioned Christ, if you be the Son of God. Okay? So recognize that. It says, if I am holy, perfect, and righteous, I can't spend any time on non-spiritual things. I have to be spiritual all the time. I have to be studying. I have to be praying. I have to be fasting. I have to be teaching. I have to be preaching. I have to be witnessing. I, I'm responsible I'm responsible for the entire world and their salvation. I have to tell this person about Jesus Christ. What if they go to hell tomorrow? Okay, you, you keep spinning out of control. Um, let me expand on that a little bit. How did I get it? Constant fasting was one thing um, for me. When I started thinking about, well, what more could I be doing for the Lord? I started comparing myself against other people and how could I, I become stronger. So I got into, uh, a couple of years ago, you know, fasting continued. I didn't talk to people, tell people about it. I knew that fasting was private between me and the Lord, but um, I started losing, you know, unhealthy amounts of weight. Um, I started feeling like I couldn't eat anymore because that would be unholy. That's where I got myself to. Um, and, of course, the enemy's trying to destroy you physically. You know, that's anorexia, if you want to lay it down. That's an eating disorder. All right? Uh, the other thing here is uh, I'm responsible for everybody else. I started, when I'd see sin openly, and I was on, you know, college campuses, um, I'd start feeling responsible for not correcting it, for not saying something and speaking up and speaking out against that sin. Okay? I started feeling responsible. And uh make a long story short, Eventually, the Lord showed me. He asked me, he said, Josh, he says, are you that person's conscience? I said, no, Lord. He says, are you that person's Savior? I said, no, I'm not Jesus Christ. He said, are you the Holy Spirit? I said, no, I'm not. And so he basically said, let me do what I do, and you serve me. Okay. Now, there's a freedom there when you aren't somebody else's conscience when you aren't their Savior. I'm not equipped spiritually to be somebody's Savior. I'm not equipped to be the Holy Spirit. I'm not equipped to be uh, somebody's conscience. I'm equipped to be one free-willed moral agent that serves Jesus Christ. And when I finally believed that truth, there was uh, total freedom from any bondage, total liberty, that all I have to do is be obedient when he provides an opportunity to speak. And sometimes it is before a large group. He provided many opportunities in school in front of an entire class of people to speak up a few words about Jesus Christ or just my personal testimony. But it was never forced. It was never pressure. I never felt like I was under condemnation. Okay? Condemnation is not coming from God. Okay? The only time condemnation is coming is it's coming from your conscience that shows you you have disobeyed and you are in violations of God's word, his moral law. That's where condemnation comes from, true condemnation. Okay? Any, anything else, false condemnation, is coming from a lie, believing a lie. I was believing that I wasn't doing enough for God. Okay? It's important to point out, too, that Satan, yeah, has temptations for people of the world. You know, direct rebellion, direct violation of the Ten Commandments. But he also has temptations for people that wholeheartedly want to serve the Lord. And not doing enough is one of those. If you truly love the Lord, if you did, you'd be doing more. You'd be in Africa and the United States at the same time. <laughs> okay? It's bondage that, that it's a total lie. It makes no sense. There's no truth to it. So let's take a look at some of the scriptures that, that talk about um, what I believe to be non-spiritual things. But um, let's, let's look at how Paul addresses them. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12. Okay, not everything we do in our life is necessarily directly in faith or spiritual, okay? Me walking to my car, yeah, I'm trusting the Lord for protection, but the whole journey there is a physical walk. It doesn't require um, faith for the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. I can see the driveway, I can see my car, I've got a pair of physical feet, and I walk on down, to, the, and there's nothing spiritual involved, okay? That's a non-spiritual thing, but it's not in violation of God's moral law. Does everybody understand that? That's how the majority of every single one of our days is, okay? Non-spiritual decisions as we live our life. 
Yes, the whole time we are in faith for salvation. Yes, we're open to any spiritual thing that the Lord might teach us, show us, or have us share to somebody. But we can't be caught up in not being able to do that kind of stuff. Okay? Because that's bondage. It's going to tie you down. 612, 1 Corinthians. Paul says, All things, 100%, are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Okay? He says, All things are, you know, yeah, I can watch a football game. Okay? Yeah, you know, um, it might not be expedient for the things of the Lord, so I won't always watch football 24 7. Okay? But you have to do things in moderation, but you can't put yourself into bondage that you can't have any leisure time. Okay? You can't have any uh, uh, time for work, the necessity of working to provide for your family, or just entertainment, you know, uh, fellowship, play cards, whatever, whatever your, your thing is. If it's not something that's sinful in nature, it's lawful for you to do. But Paul just says, I'm not going to be brought under any one of those things. But you are free to do them. Those things are there to be enjoyed, but appropriately. Okay, and we all could get. Um, oh, I know I could at least. You know, in football, if it was football season, I could get drawn into that if I allowed myself to. I'd be watching every single game. You know, memorizing stats and stuff. Where instead of maybe watching a couple games a week or or whatever it might be, you know, be persuaded in your own conscience. But you aren't under bondage to not do those things. It's not what the word says. But that's where I allowed myself to go. I got to the point where I was. I tried to take home my accounting homework, and this is legitimate things for me to do. This is how I'm preparing myself to provide for my family and and the ministry later in my life. This is something that is of God. It's right. And yet I couldn't focus on one problem because I was afraid I wasn't doing something spiritual for the Lord. So I'd pick up my Bible and I'd go through the Bible and I couldn't even concentrate on the Bible. Just constant fear that I wasn't doing enough for the Lord. It's bondage. It's a horrible place to be. So we can head it off by sticking to the truth. What does the word actually say? Yeah, it says study to show thyself approved unto God. You think God meant you shouldn't be sleeping and constantly studying to show yourself approved? No, it's appointed on a man six days to work, one day to rest. That's why we live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. We don't allow Satan to take one scripture and twist it. We have to live by the totality of the truth, the whole truth. All right, moving on. Uh, 1 Corinthians 10.23 basically says the same thing. So that's there for your reference. So when you get distracted by, from the truth, by a lie, by some type of uh, deception, uh, you go into the five D's. Okay? First you get distracted. And what do you get distracted from? You get distracted from the Word of God. Okay? You start believing... Satan's report, a lie, instead of God's report, the truth. And at the first place, everything comes in will always be your thinking pillar, the mind. All right? And if you don't deal with it, and you start playing with it and thinking on it, and you don't settle it according to the Word of God, well, then you get into confusion. Okay? In confusion, uh, you're unstable in every way. If you're confused, you aren't settled. You can't be confused and in faith at the same time. You either have it settled and you're in God's kind of faith, or you're confused. God says if you lack wisdom or you're in confusion, know that God is not the author of confusion. And he'll give to all men liberally. Okay? Elizabeth asked for wisdom. God got her wisdom. That's how it works. He's more than happy to give it away. But Satan will plant something, a lie. You might just hear something... um, from somebody else, somebody that's repeating the lies of Satan. Um, Brian prayed earlier that there's a lot of people in religious circles that have religious lies. You know, well, one sin doesn't separate you. Well, that originates from the enemy. And the whole purpose is to get you out of faith so that he can... Remember the shield of faith when you have all your pillars up? Okay, If Satan can get that down by rocking any one of these pillars or getting you off your foundation, off the cornerstone then he'll chuck as many fiery darts as he possibly can get in. It's not going to be like just one lie and it stops there. 
It's going to be one lie, and if you buy it, he's going to give you another one to lead you further away and closer to destruction. So you're going to get distracted from the truth. You're going to become disappointed at the situation. Okay? I was preaching to people, but there was no response. It wasn't spirit-led preaching, okay? I was giving away truth. I was speaking truth. Nothing wrong with that. But I wasn't getting response from people because they weren't open. So I got disappointed at that. You know, constant opposition. Nobody was open to the truth. It wasn't spirit-led. When it's spirit-led, you may not see immediate fruits, but you'll know and you'll have peace about it that, yep, I was supposed to say that. I know that was of the Lord. I know that that seed water or you harvested. Okay, but it's going to be one of those, and it's always going to be at peace, not confusion. So you get discouraged. Should be next. Discouraged. I was talking about this with Brian earlier this week. Discouraged means uh, the opposite of courage. Okay, you become disheartened. Your heart fails within you. Um, you lack moral courage, and this is where I got to also. I started uh, getting to the point where I was just afraid to go out into the world, just afraid to be around sinners. I started cutting myself off from everything. I did. I was. A, I was here, done two tours in Iraq, tons of stuff that you know, I shouldn't have a problem walking out into civilian life in the United States, and yet I was afraid to go out and confront sinners. I got to that point because I was believing a lie. And then you get depressed. The situation seems hopeless. How did I get here? What's happening? You're depressed. Hopelessness. This is how it goes, down the D's. And then ultimately, destruction. Or we'll just put death right next to it. Those are the five D's. If you get distracted off the truth. That's why I encourage you If you ever see a distraction, you have to weigh it against the Word of God and cast it down immediately, and you can avoid all these. I don't wish these upon anybody. Um, I'm familiar, very familiar with all of them, and I don't wish that on anybody. It's a very hard pit to walk out of, and the only thing that will ever get you out of it is the same thing that could have helped you avoid it, and that's the Word of God, the truth, okay? I, I encourage people, if you hear something and, and, you know, it seems zealous and stuff, I encourage to err on the ca- side of caution rather than going full-fledged towards, you know, whatever it might be, teaching, fasting, prayer, anything that you're just going headlong into, I'd err on the side of caution. I'd check out the scriptures and see what, see what it says. I'd settle it before I start getting involved in it. And that's what God commands us to do, study to show ourselves approved. So Roman numeral 2, um, letter B, having a false concept or understanding of spiritual perfection, point 1. And this is, I've been here too on this one. If I am holy, perfect, and righteous, I should be able to stop temptation altogether. If even a wicked thought comes into my mind, oh my goodness, I should be able to stop a wicked thought or a wicked anything from ever even getting to here if I'm truly holy, perfect, and righteous. But that's not what the Word says. Word says in uh, 1 Corinthians 10.13 says that temptation is common to all men. Common to all men. Even Jesus Christ walked on the earth was tempted. Think about the thoughts that Satan presented to him. Bow down and worship me. Well, that's about the most wicked thing God could ever do. A holy God bow down and worship a completely unholy being. And yet Christ was presented with that. And yet he wasn't rocked by it. He simply stated, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him alone shalt thou serve. But the thought was there. Christ you know, had to reason it out and come back with the word. He had to deal with it. But yet Christ was without sin. So 10.13, it says, There has no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man, common to all men. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able You'll always be able to overcome the temptation. God is faithful. He'll never allow anything that you can't handle. But will with the temptation also make a way to escape, that you may be able to bear it. And that will always be his word of God, his standard. And then he says, blessed is the man that endures temptation. It's an opportunity to serve him. All right, let's take a look in Scripture about somebody that went through um, the D's. 
a man named Jonah. And I went on the Jonah experience, but it was spiritual. Where is Jonah? There he is. All right, I'll just uh, sum up chapter 1 real quick. Uh, Jonah is given a command to go preach at Nineveh, preach repentance, preach that Nineveh will be destroyed, I believe, in 40 days. And if you do not repent, that destruction will happen. Well, Jonah thinks that the Lord will spare the city if he goes and preaches repentance, and they repent. So he chooses not to obey that mission. So he starts running from God. Okay, He hides himself. He goes down to the port, gets on the ship, goes down into the middle of the ship, and then gets tossed off the ship, he goes down in the water, and the whale swallows him, and he goes down in the belly, and then while he's in the belly, he's getting choked out by uh, all sorts of things. And that's where we're going to pick it up right here. Chapter 2, Jonah. Then Jonah prayed unto the Lord his God out of the fish, fish's belly, and said, I cried by reason of mine affliction unto the Lord, and he heard me out of the belly of hell, cried I, and thou heardest my voice. For thou hadst cast me into the deep, in the midst of the seas, and the floods compassed me about. All thy billows and thy waves passed over me. Then I said, I am cast out of your sight, yet I will look again toward your holy temple. The waters compassed me about, even to the soul. The depth closed me round about. The weeds were wrapped about my head. I went down to the bottoms of the mountains. The earth with her bars was about me forever. Yet hast thou brought up my life from corruption, O Lord my God. When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came into thee, unto thee, into thine holy temple. And I want to point out one thing. Okay? Jonah's in the worst possible situation. He's totally at the bottom of the D's. He's, he's borderline death right now. And yet the Lord still hears a sincere prayer. Okay? Even at the, the bottom of the pit, all right? he hears it. He's, he's underwater in the middle of the belly of a whale, probably gurgling, not speaking clearly, and yet the Lord hears him. Okay? There's no place out of reach for the Lord to hear you. But you have to call unto him with a sincere heart. And Jonah says, and this is the most profound statement of the book of Jonah, in my opinion. He says, they that observe lying vanities, if you believe a lie, you forsake your own mercy. This is why it's so important to believe the truth and not a lie. And then Jonah goes on to say, But I will sacrifice unto thee with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay that that I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. And immediately the Lord spake unto the fish, and it vomited him out, Jonah, upon dry land. Okay? And he was right back to his original mission. And when I was at the, uh, the point spiritually where I was getting choked out, and then I repented of believing a lie. And I called out on the Lord, and he answered, and he vomited me out. So it's, it's not cool to get vomited out, but praise the Lord, it was liberty <laughs> and delivered. But you can avoid all these by believing the truth and not observing a lie. Okay? They that observe lying vanities forsake their own mercy. So we don't want to do that. And what is false condemnation uh, and bondage? Oh, excuse me. False condemnation and bondage comes from observing lies. And then bondage defined. Let's go over this one: slavery or involuntary servitude, captivity or restraint. And when you're in bondage, you are. You're trapped. You're a captive of the enemy. You're taken by Satan because you've observed one of his lies. And the only thing that will free you is the truth. Let's go to some scriptures that refer to bondage. Galatians 5.1. What does God say? Galatians chapter 5, verse 1. He says, Stand fast, or hold your ground, therefore, in the liberty, the freedom, wherewith Christ has made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Okay. Christ says, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. All right. 
Now, if I have to go rebuke everybody in the entire world before sundown, that's a pretty heavy burden. What if two people are walking two different ways and I'm on the sidewalk? Which one do I choose goes to hell as they walk by? Which one do I talk to? Which one do I preach to? Okay? That's the bondage that's not of God. The Lord will lead you. If he wants you to talk to both of them, he'll stop them in their tracks, and you'll get a, a free audience with them, a captive audience. You'll be able to talk to them. So be not entangled with the yoke of bondage. You're free. Hebrews 2, 14 through 15. Let's find out how. Hebrews chapter 2, 14 and 15. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, and that's what we observed this morning, taking communion, was confirming that we are partakers of his flesh and his blood. He also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death, his sacrifice, he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. All right? Christ has destroyed, made ineffective, the works of the devil. Okay? He can free us from sin, liberate us from bondage to sin, and keep us free. But it's, it has to be through Christ, and it has to be continuing with Christ in spirit and truth. But I assure you the work of the cross is sufficient to free you. Romans eight fifteen through 21 Let's find out what God says about condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. Because we know the world is condemned for their disobedience and rejection of the truth. But what does it say about the believer? Is there any condemnation in the believer's life? There is therefore now, presently, the moment you come into relationship with Jesus Christ, no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. There's no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. None. Zero. God deals in absolutes. No condemnation. You're free. And you know that you're in Him if you walk as He walks. You live as He lives. So if there's no condemnation in Jesus Christ, let's define what liberty is. Liberty defined. You are free from restraint, free from captivity. You're no longer a prisoner. And then practically speaking, your body could be freed. You could be restrained in handcuffs, but you could be freed bodily, physically. But also your mind and your will is free. Okay? God has set every moral creature, uh, moral agent, at liberty with their will. He doesn't control. He doesn't restrain their will. You have liberty with your free will. But he encourages us not to take that liberty and believe lies, but to believe his truth and obey him and serve him, because that's the highest good for everybody, including yourself. And then right back to Galatians 5.1. Notice there's a contrast between bondage and liberty. Okay, Liberty is in the Christian walk. Liberty is in faith. Okay, you can't be in bondage and uh, walking out the liberty that Christ has for you. Okay, there's no bondage in the Christian walk. And if there is, I encourage you to look at the scriptures and be persuaded that you don't have to hang on to any of that bondage. You can give it over to the Lord. You can walk in liberty, the perfect law of liberty. Okay, he says, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. If there's any confusion, if there's anything that's taking away your peace or your joy, you can deal with it. There's truth that will liberate you. So stand fast, therefore, in the liberty that we have in Jesus Christ, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. I choose not to be entangled with the bondage I was just talking about for the last half hour. I choose not to. It's not that I couldn't go get wrapped up in it again. It's I choose not to. I choose to stand fast in the truth. That's the answer, the Word of God, Jesus Christ. All right, there's a couple more scriptures. We're going to move on to point two, though. Let's go to freedom defined. 
we all heard freedom. We grew up in the United States. This is a pretty common word. It's thrown around back and forth quite a bit. Freedom defined. What is freedom? It's simply being at liberty. Pretty cool, isn't it? Freedom is being at liberty. Free from any type of bondage. Yeah, there's, there's a freedom in this country, but then there's a freedom much greater than that. It's spiritual liberty. Free from sin, death, and hell. And the freedom to choose holiness continually. That's true freedom. Let's find out where that comes from. John 8.32 I don't care what your situation is, whether it would be one similar to myself or another type of situation. This is the answer. This is the key. John 8.32 Then Jesus said to those Jews which believed on him, that's us, we believe on him, If you continue in my word, then you are my disciples indeed not in lies of the enemy or lying vanities, but his word. And he says, if you do that, you shall know the truth, God's truth, and God's truth shall make you free. And then verse 36, and if the Son, Jesus Christ, therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. But it's our job to stand fast and hold it, not let the enemy take any ground. And that's the message for today.